In the fabled land of Northern California, nestled in the Valley of Sacramento, two friends begin a journey to enlighten the world about their experience living life as a Zinio. But what is a Zinio, you may ask? If you wish to know, then follow them on their adventures. Welcome to the Zinio Chronicles. This is James. This is Mike. And uh, for this episode, um, I have a special inspiration. It's an inspiration that's near and dear to my uh, stomach, I guess. Because <laughs> uh, my stomach rules me in many ways, even more than my heart does. Although it's a bad day to say that since uh, tomorrow is actually uh, mine and my wife's uh, 19th wedding anniversary. 19 <laughs> years of being married. But even she knows that that the stomach is the best way to to reach me um i think uh, a few minutes ago she was even asking me uh hey what do we have what do you what do you want to have for dinner tomorrow it's our anniversary so that was her main thought about our anniversary is what i might want for dinner because the stomach leads and literally it leads the way i mean my stomach projects out more than any other part of my body so it's what kind of literally more than any other part <laughs> but it's what kind of motivates and, and drives me forward in just about everything that I do. Um, you know, it's it's what makes me sneak away when I get the opportunity to go grab a hamburger at Five Guys. You know what I mean? Because their burgers are so good, <laughs> as we discussed in a previous podcast. Yes, yes. Um, but there's a specific food item that I kind of wanted to talk about, a much maligned food item, at least here in, in uh, well, in California, I'd say, depending on what, what, uh, what racial group or ethnic group that you belong to, this is a maligned food item. But really? Some groups see this as a great food item. And there's kind of three things that, uh, other than the, the item itself being something I love, there's three things that kind of keep it always fresh in my memory. One of them is a, a, a friend of mine who passed a few years ago. Oh, okay. who, um, this was one of his, one of the foods that he really liked because of actually where he grew up. And it was something that him and I did share together on a few meals before oh, okay. he did pass. Okay. Um, it's also, there's also kind of a connection that I always find amusing and always makes me think of when I think of this food, I think of an Adam Sandler movie, one of his weirder movies. Some people, and even I think that there are moments in it that are kind of sweet, but at the same time, it's, it, it, it's sweet and yet super disturbing. Interesting. Um, okay. And then, and then my the, the other the other thing that has recently brought this back to my mind is my sister in law, and so um, I'll discuss the friend connection later once I start discussing what the what this food item is really. Okay. Um, uh, it'll, it'll come up later as far as when I talk about where he's from. But let's start with the Adam Sandler movie. The Adam Sandler movie I'm speaking of is, uh, in fact, this actually talks about the location immediately. Uh, Fifty first dates. Oh, okay. Is the, okay. Is the Adam Sandler movie, which right. again, I think it's kind of, it has, I think it's kind of sweet that he does what he can to make this this woman fall in love with him every single day. Spoilers: If you have not seen the movie, she <laughs> she loses her memory every night. If you haven't, I mean, it's it's what a twenty year old movie, so people, right. you need to have seen the damn thing. Um, almost at this point, but, you can uh, almost glean that from the title of the film too. When yeah, you really think uh, about and, it, uh, you would you would think, yeah. Um, but. Uh, it's kind of sweet that he that he loves her enough. He wants to put in the effort to make her fall in love with him every single day for the rest of her life. Yeah, but it's also it's, that's also kind of a little creepy in, in some ways, especially uh, before he. The, yeah, before, I guess when you think about it, before huh? he makes before he makes the video and the book and stuff for her, he's kind of a stalkery guy that uh, that is stalking her literally every single day. So it's a little bit, but it's both creepy, but, but there's always that fine line where something can be, can be sweet and creepy at the same time. And it just depends on what the <laughs> intention is, whether it's, whether it's sweet or whether it's creepy. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, it, it's sweepy. like, it can be, if you can, if you can go to, if you can go to a restaurant and like order the exact food that your significant other wants and would, would like to eat, know every single part of the exact food they would want to eat or make it exactly a full meal, exactly as they would want it to be with dessert and all of that stuff. Right. That could be both super, super sweet, but also depending on whether they're your significant other, or they're just somebody that you've been watching. It could be super, super creepy. <laughs> it just depends on what your relationship is and what the intent behind it right, is. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, you've I, been I mean, paying sure attention can go multiple ways here. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly, exactly. Sometimes it's a good thing you've been paying attention. Sometimes it means you've been looking through binoculars uh, <laughs> in my window and my blinds, and you notice the birthmark on my ass. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's... It's it's a it's a toss up there. It's a very um, good point. <laughs> but it in that in that movie, 
uh, at one point, uh, there, there's discussion of spam and Reese's. And here's the thing. We're not talking about Reese's today. What we are talking about is spam. We're talking about spam oh. is our topic. Okay. Okay. Yes. Spam luncheon meat in the can. <laughs> probably, probably something that most people. I, I'm more, I, actually, I won't say most people. There's a lot of people that have a, 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 a strange opinion of it. And most of them are people that have never had the opportunity to try it. Never right. see what it was like. Right. Um, and spam has a very interesting history. Uh, it, it's, uh, 51st dates for instance takes place on hawaii and it's mentioned in in that movie as a as a, a food item and again a joking thing of making spam and reese's together which horrible combination i think i was gonna say um, you're you're saying at the same time uh like yeah that's 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 simultaneously in the, in the uh, mouth that doesn't sound yeah, like a good idea at all yeah the guy that uh, the character in the movie uh he's called tattoo face he works as the cook at a restaurant <laughs> Um, he, he mentions he, he offers to make spam and Reese's for, uh, Adam Sandler's character. Um, uh, by the way, I've watched this movie a bunch of times cause again, right. it runs that line between creepy and sweet. I think it's sweet and I love watching it. It's one of my movies that puts right. a smile on my face when I'm feeling crappy. That's um, great. Just, just a funny, it's a funny, stupid, enjoyable movie. Funny. Cause I, I, I am not a fan of Drew Barrymore at all, but I do like Adam Sandler. I, I like Sean Astin, and Sean Astin p- plays probably one of the best characters he's ever played. Although almost everything Sean Astin does is fantastic. Um, oh man, I've been a fan. I, of I gotta since see this again. I really do. I haven't seen it in in well over a decade. Well, and it's actually it's actually a fairly good part played by uh, Rob Schneider in this. Oh really? Um, okay. Yeah, he actually he he, he plays because uh, he. Rob Schneider, he, he walks that line again. We're talking weird lines of people walk of being funny and super offensive. And right. he, he goes one of like, the, one of the two ways. Uh, he plays a lot of ethnic characters because he does have mis- mixed ethnicity. Right. So he, sometimes they're okay. Sometimes they're cringe worthy. Um, this one he's playing, he's playing a native Hawaiian and um, it's over the top. But again, my oh, friend man. who passed, he was raised in Hawaii. He white guy raised in Hawaii, and okay. that was one of the. Uh, I I would ask him sometimes about movies that are set in Hawaii or take place in Hawaii. I would ask him, you know, how much of this is kind of real to the culture, how much of it is not. Um, he said that Rob Schneider's character was actually pretty uh, real to the culture. He knew a lot of guys like that. Wow. Um, he okay. also said when I, when uh, the first one I asked him about, by the way, was Lilo and Stitch. Because he had kids, I, I I have kids, and our kids uh, did play around, played together at different points in times and whatnot. Yeah. And um, I, I had I had asked him at one point. I think we were watching Lilo and Stitch with the kids, and I'm like, so what part of this is is kind of realistic? As well, they do they did pretty good with the background stuff. It's it's lush and green and beautiful there. And then uh, the scene where the uh, the, the uh, Lilo. The little girl yeah. beats up the little white girl. The, beats up the little white girl with the red hair and the and the glasses. Right. Says, yeah, that's probably the most realistic scene in the entire movie. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm, whoa. Like, I'm like, really? He goes, oh yeah, oh yeah. People, they, gr- girls out there in Hawaii, they'll just throw it out and fight no matter what. And it's usually one of the native girls fighting a little white girl. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's good to know. He goes, hey man, I'm just telling you. Asked what it was, what it was true. I'm telling it like it is. I'm All like, right. right, okay. No, sir. But um, cool. anyway, to, the, <laughs> to, 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 the, to, to the topic of spam, um, this has become, again, these are things that I'm always reminded of when I think of spam. I'm reminded of my friend. I'm reminded of 50 First Dates. And the reason it's come back into my memory uh, and to the forefront of my mind recently is my sister-in-law has located a, a food truck um, near, our, near where our housing development is. Okay. That is, uh, at certain nights of the week, food trucks show up at the uh, gas stations that are near our housing development. For uh, you know, it's it's a pretty decent housing development, you know, fairly nice houses. So the and but we're far away from any fast food places. There's like you you, you have at least a 15 20 minute drive to get to uh, even you know a Taco Bell, a Burger King, and McDonald's, and those are the things that are like everywhere. Right, right, right. We for sure, n- we we have nothing really by us. Um, so the food trucks are kind of a boon for for us. I mean, you pay a little bit more money at a food truck, but you typically get way better food than fast food. And uh, more variety, more you know, more variety than just a burger and fries and uh, what passes for an attempt at Mexican food at Taco Bell. Um, 
<laughs> yes, but understandable. Um, you, you and you pay a little more, but you don't have to drive, and the food is so much better. It's worth the money. I mean, do do you do you buy the hamburger at McDonald's for two dollars, or do you pay seven dollars and buy the hamburger at Five Guys? I'm not saying Five Guys is is a food truck, but it's better food. You pay right, for, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this specific place that she's been going to, it's a it's an Asian food truck. It's like an Asian fusion food truck. And right. the thing that she keeps getting at this food truck is a spam and rice dish. And I I, I just keep like, why aren't you picking me up some of this crap? Because I love me some spam too. Spam is great. Oh, okay. I'll have some spam and eggs. You get, I'll buy a can of spam and I'll just, that's, that's great food right there. That's amazing. Um, Dude, okay, and, so I am not very, like, I have had, I have not had spam in an extremely long time. I am not well versed in the ways of spam. Um, but you're making me want spam because you, <laughs> you keep just, not just saying the word spam, but you're just, you're you're mixing it up with how well it goes with other stuff. It's starting to it's starting to get at me here. Well, what's what I find nice about it is it's like one of those things that okay, if you're making chicken, right? Let's say you're making chicken. Okay. What do you put on the chicken for seasoning before you make it? Oh you man, you put in some salt, pepper, maybe some uh, some. You, you have your own seasoning, some garlic, maybe. Yeah, some a little onions, bit of. Yeah, some, I do. It, it's kind of all over the place. There's actually a, a really, really good um, poultry seasoning that I have in the cabinet okay. that I use on almost anything that is a bird. Okay, um, so um, so so now if you're having uh, if you're having um, steak, you got a seasoning that you put on your steak, right? Right. Or, or if you buy a really good steak, if you buy a really, really good steak, like if you get a T-bone or a porterhouse or something like that, right. the only thing you technically should be putting on it is salt and pepper. And okay. if you put anything else on it, you, there's no then, then you need to buy better steak. Because, I mean, <laughs> a really good steak, a really, really good fair. steak just That's needs fair. a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. Right. And if you, if you put steak sauce on it, stop listening to this. If you are li- a listener and you use steak sauce on your steak, nope. just don't ever order steak again. Nope. Just order chicken because what? what you're telling me you don't love steak. You love <laughs> steak sauce. Just take a shot of steak sauce and eat some chicken and don't embarrass yourself. Okay. Okay. So here, here's the issue with, that I've heard that. with steak. Hard stand on that. I get you. I understand. But the thing is, is that if the steak is not cooked right and you can fuck up a steak easy, like steak is pretty simple for the most part. Then you should, but you most should people, make it yourself. Huh? You, here's the thing: either you should make it yourself, or you should go. You should only order steak at a place that cooks the steak right. Yes, don't exactly, and that's the point a, that I'm getting at. Yeah, don't order a steak at Applebee's; they will mess it up. Yeah, because they mess everything up. Their food is disgusting. Yeah, that's why they um, offer you the steak sauce because it sucks. You know, I, th- there is a place in the Sacramento area that I would definitely order a steak. In fact, every time I go there, I order the porterhouse steak nice. because it is flipping amazing. <laughs> but like. Again, order a steak. If it's a steakhouse, order a steak. And order a good steak. Order a steak with a bone in it. Don't order that New York strip steak because you're getting screwed with a New York strip steak. Order yourself a T-bone because that has New York New York strip steak and the filet mignon all in one package. And there's a bone in there which actually helps flavor and cook it properly. But what do I know? Anyway, we're not talking about steak. Okay, I did not know that. Normally, I'm like, yeah, New York strip or sirloin. But uh, that's, no, that's no, my no, no, thing. No. The, the the big side of a T-bone? Yeah. That's 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 what they cut the New York strip off of. I'll be damned. So so screw getting the New York strip, get the damn T-bone or or the porterhouse which is a, the bigger portion of the T-bone. Get the get those. Those are so much better. Ah. Plus you plus you, again the bone adds flavor, the bone helps it actually cook better. For so sure. Get okay. The, get, yeah. Get the damn T-bone. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. But anyway, the point I'm making is you season some steak to some extent. Yeah. If you're doing if you're doing most pork products, you season them. Except for there's one pork product you don't really season because it's already been seasoned uh, in the curing process, and that's that's uh, bacon. You don't really season that. Right. You don't. You just kind of um, throw it down. And that's it. And you have things like corned beef, which is already pre-brined and seasoned and whatnot. Yeah. There's some things that require it. Now, admittedly, the the spam gets its its pre-seasoning. But what's beautiful about it is you. Pop it out of the can. You slice that that weird shaped loaf thing into <laughs> into a couple of slices. Right. You just throw it in. A, just throw it into the pan and fry it up in the pan. You don't need no oil. You don't need no butter because there's enough fat in there that it just fries up. It's a beautiful crisp on each side. It's so amazing. 
Really? Melts in your okay. Mouth. A beautiful flavor. Okay. 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 This is, this is and this is one of my one of my kind of favorite treats to give myself. A spam and egg breakfast, some spam with some scrambled eggs. You cannot go wrong with that breakfast. This is amazing. This, this spam can be used in so many things. You can you, you are can, really you can, selling you me on this man. Sandwich. Like you can you can break it up into little cubes and put it in. Okay, like here's here's a freaky take on breakfast burrito. Get yourself some uh, get yourself hash browns, right? Okay. Throw hash browns as your base in your burrito. Throw okay. some scrambled eggs on top of that. Throw some, take your take your spam after you've cooked it. Chop it up into little like cubes. Cube it up. Oh. Throw that in, throw that in there, and yep. then your your choice of hot sauce or salsa or whatever else you put in there. Boom! Whole different take on a breakfast burrito. Okay. If yeah. You want, if you want to put cheese in there, you can put cheese in there. I don't like mixing cheese with my eggs. It's just a personal thing. As much as I love cheese. Real cheese, real cheese. <laughs> Make sure we're clear on this. Hey, I have, I time. have sliced che- or real I have, cheese. Hey, I have cheddar in my fridge, bro. That's good. That's I have good. it. I'm just saying. I'm not. I'm not saying it to you. Don't think I'm coming after you about this. Or if, if you think it's about you, then it is about you because you're thinking it. <laughs> but I'm not coming after you. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I'm just saying real cheese. Okay? All right. All right. I'm just saying real all cheese. Right. No, I, I, um, I get it. I'm fighting against the, the, the love of, of American cheese. It's disgusting. People should just get rid of it. Real cheese. Um, but anyway, this is, it's a whole different take on your breakfast burrito because you, the flavors that, that Spam will bring in, is it, it, they're milder than, say, like a chorizo, which, hey, I'm all down for chorizo and eggs in, in a breakfast burrito. That's, that's a nice little thing. Although, interestingly, lately, turkey chorizo, really good instead of beef. Or pork. I'm going to have to Ground. find turkey chorizo. I have never yeah. found turkey chorizo. Where do you find your turkey chorizo? I will tell you later. Yes, it, it, please. We, I, I only, I've only had it once, but it was actually really good because it was a little... For me, I'm not... I, I don't deal with uh, super spicy food too well. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little too pale for that. So... Um, and so are my intestines. So... The turkey chorizo is actually a little bit milder than your beef and your pork chorizos, right? And so it was a little easier. It was a little easier going down. It was a little easier coming out. So that, those are good things <laughs> for me. Um, yeah, no, I'm but, a chorizo uh, nut, dude. I love the hell out of chorizo. That doesn't surprise too me. much. But actually, the the, the the again, the spam gives you a different flavor profile than like uh, like sausage in the in your breakfast burrito or bacon in your breakfast burrito. Mm-hmm. It's a whole different flavor profile. It's and it's kind of a nice flavor profile. Um, so spam, spam means a lot to me. It's a, it's an important food. I love it. I only, I only get it occasionally because I like it. The, these, the sister-in-law is never around enough to eat it with me. So it's usually just me eating it. The wife doesn't like it. And the grandmother's kind of on the fence with it. She'll eat it, but it's not her choice. These are all, these are all the people in the household that might possibly eat the spam. So it's left up right. to me. And a can of spam is, it's a decent amount of spam. I mean, I think it's like half a pound for a can of spam. And I can do that. It just isn't healthy for me to do that on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Eat that much meat in one sitting. Um, but anyway, anyway, these, again, these, the thing that's brought this back to my brain was the, these spam and rice bowls that my, uh, that my sister-in-law has been getting. And I, I was thinking about it. I remember way back when the first kind of, first kind of introduction to spam that I got and it was actually as a kid and I had a, a friend that lived down the street I believe he was he was Vietnamese uh-huh. but his family ate spam all the time okay and it was it, it, it was kind of at the time it was just some weird canned gelatinous meat thing that smelled <laughs> smelled kind of good but smelled also it had a kind of a weird smell okay. and it seemed just, it seems so foreign to me. And I will, I will admit I was raised in a household that was, uh, as far as cuisine went was very, very much, uh, your classic bland American cuisine. Right. Um, to the, to the extent of like, you know, <sighs> baked or fried chicken and mashed potatoes or baked potatoes and like, corn for your vegetable that was like a regular meal at at, at my house growing up when we went a little wild and my mom decided she was going to make like tacos this is what tacos was at my house growing up i think i've discussed this before on the podcast but just to give a better enlightenment for the specific conversation right now okay so that people don't have to go and look where did james talk about tacos before give me (laughs) the information now um tacos when i was growing up was uh ground beef 
right? Brown, browned ground beef right. with a little bit of garlic salt, seasoned salt, and pepper. Okay. Um, fried corn tortillas. Right. Shredded cheddar cheese. At least we got real cheese there. Right. Real cheese. <laughs> and maybe if my mother had bought some lettuce. That was tacos. That's all that came with tacos. Oh man. Okay. So you even had you had. I mean that is uh, that is bland for even white people tacos, man. Oh, it gets better. My mother, when making her own tacos, would put ketchup on her tacos. What in the hell was wrong with your mom? Oh, I that we need a couple podcasts for that. So. <laughs> Um, especially okay, when it comes no, to your food stuff. No, no. Okay. Um, uh-uh. Actually, I will tell you. I, will tell I don't you, know I will tell what. You. I'll make. I'll make a quick encapsulation for you. Okay. Here's here's the quick encapsulation. My mother lived at a time, obviously, because of the age we're at. Our, our parent, our parents would have lived at a time where their parents made food and you ate it whether you liked it or not, and you ate everything on your plate. At least in some households, my mother grew up in that type of household where her parents made their food. And there's like my mother would tell me stories about them making her half a chicken, each each her and her brothers half a chicken for dinner plus sides, and they had to eat everything on their plate, even if they were full. Oh they my had goodness, to eat all that is so much food. And I I have trouble with half a chicken sometimes. Like I go to El yeah. Pollo Loco, get me half a chicken. I don't always finish it. Um, yeah, dude, but half anyway. a chicken is a lot of by itself is a lot of food. It is. And then add sides and everything else in it. And this is being fed to preteens and teenagers. It's a lot of damn food. But anyway. Yeah, no, that's a mistake. But I still am am a little like, I'm, I I don't. Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. Because my brain hurts at the concept here. There was a lot of foods that my mother was forced to eat because that's what was made and what was on her plate um, that she could not stand eating. And the only way she got around being able to eat these things was by putting ketchup on them. Well, as she became an adult, instead of stopping making any of these foods or making them in other ways that would make her want to eat them, she right. just still made these foods and covered them in ketchup, like scrambled eggs. She'd make, we, we'd have a breakfast, which is probably the most flavorful meal that was made as I was growing up. Right. Um, We'd have breakfast, and you know, you got scrambled eggs, you got bacon, you got uh, fried potatoes, you got waffles. I would make a sandwich out of all of that because it's amazing to have a sandwich made out of all of that. Yes, but yes, my, it is. You know, my mother would have all of these separate pieces, and she would cover the eggs in in uh, the scrambled eggs in ketchup. And I think I asked her one time, "Why do you do that?" Because the only way I like eggs. I'm like, "Well, if you don't like eggs, why are you eating them? You're an adult. You don't have to." <laughs> and she kind of gave me a blank stare, I'm like. But they're eggs. I'm like, so don't eat the damn things. If you don't like them, don't eat them. I don't. If I don't like <laughs> something, I don't eat the damn thing. Nobody makes me eat anything that I don't like. That was actually my entire childhood. People hated me for that. The fact that if I didn't like something, I, I just wouldn't eat it. I was I was the, the person who would, like, out of politeness, eat something that made me sick. I would just refuse to eat things. People would get so, especially adults, adults would be so mad at me as a kid, glaring at me like, how dare you not eat this thing that I made? Well, I'm sorry. I don't eat that crap. I don't eat eggs when you cover them in cheese. I like cheese, real cheese, but not on my eggs. See, I'm keeping it all fine. Together, yeah, so. there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's actually, I was kind of part of that too, the you're going to eat it and you're going to like it whether you like it or not kind of crowd. Like, I was that kind of a well, kid my, too. I, I was lucky that my, my mother's policy was, my, my, my parents' policy was, we're going to make what we're going to make for dinner. If you don't like what we make for dinner, then in the cabinet, there are a bunch of cans of, uh, of pasta, there's cereal, there's bread, there's peanut butter, there's anything else you want to make. If you don't like what we're making for food, go ahead and make yourself something else. We're not making you something else, especially once I was a teenager and whatnot, you know, preteen teenager when I could use a microwave and cook my own food. Yeah, for sure. Like, we're not, listen, we're not going to, we're, we're making what we're making. We know what you do and don't eat, but we're making what we're making. If for some reason you don't feel like eating our food, go make yourself something else and you can eat what you want to. And, and that, that was, wow. that was kind of thing. And that was, that was mainly because my mother was forced to eat so many different things. It used to be great when we'd go to her parents' house for Christmas Eve and for Thanksgiving. 
Um, we used to do that for, for many years, probably the first 13 years of my life. We went to their house for Christmas Eve and for Thanksgiving almost every year. And uh, when, when I would be sitting at the table with my cousins, my cousins were raised in that same type of household where their parents made their plates for them and told them what they were going to eat, and they had to eat all of it. I never had my plate made for me until I was at my you know, my grandparents' place or at somewhere else, somebody else's place yeah. that wouldn't let kids make their plate for them. At home, I just grabbed what I wanted to. Whatever was there, I grabbed the pieces and the amounts that I wanted to. The only rule was if I did, if I put it on my plate, I, again, I, I, you know, I can make my own stuff, but if I put the food on my plate, I either needed to eat it or save it and eat it later. It was, that is know, okay. If you, that if makes you don't, so much it, yeah. fucking sense. That if you don't, if you don't want to, if you, if you only want to take a little bit, you can go back for seconds, but don't pile a whole bunch of stuff on your plate and then waste food because you, you got too full. Take a little bit, eat what you can. If you want more, go get some more. And if you do have some left over, save it and eat it later. So you're not wasting food. That makes a lot of sense to that me. That makes no, okay, dude, that makes so much sense. Like I did not have like, that wasn't what, that wasn't what was put in my mind. Like. Overall, yeah. th- there was, um, I had a split family. Uh, one side of the family was, you know, take what you want and eat what you take. And that's fine. Like that was one. But then another side of my family was more like, this is what we're making. You're going to have it because this is what we're making for dinner. Yeah. If you don't like it, you're either not eating or you're going to eat everything on your plate. Like period. Yeah. So your plate served up. You better finish it because we busted our ass to make this, like to to have this on the table. That was the that was the idea. And now it's kind of funny because I tend to see now I I overeat. Um, I also have. um, I also will eat damn near anything. And I well, also, and, now that's just and, kind and of so, part of like I'm, that, I'm non-discriminate when it comes to most food, unless you put ketchup on a taco. What the no, hell I, is that? Believe me, believe me, that's always the fun one to tell people because that's where people like ketchup on their scrambled eggs. Some people could be like, all right, I can understand that. When you say ketchup on a taco, that's like, what? What the hell? There was no hot <laughs> sauce in our house, by the way. Never any hot sauce growing up. Um, my dad would buy paste picante salsa, but that was his salsa to be used to eat chips with while he was watching football games. Right. Now, my dad. My dad actually had a, a much more expanded palate, specifically with, uh, with Mexican food. He was a huge fan of Mexican food. I mean, right. he would make his, himself some Mexican food dishes, some real spicy, real nice Mexican food dishes. Mm-hmm. But as a kid, I was always too afraid to try any of those things. Oh, man. Because they were all weird. They uh, were all some weird dishes. I was, I was, I was kind of was very, very picky. I kind of followed some of my mom's form for many years. When I became an adult and started getting out more with different food things, my, my taste buds expanded. My flavors expanded. The, again, there's still my few hard nose, uh, you know, uh, raw fish, still a hard no, uh, avocado, throw it away. Um, I still have my, my places where like, nope. And, and I can say this at least this much. I've tasted avocado. It is disgusting and gross. I want nothing to do with it. I, <laughs> I haven't gotten to the point of trying the, the raw fish yet. So I'm not ready to do it yet in my life. There may be a time when I am now is not it. So I, I can say that that one is still, that one is still, I just haven't gotten over that hurdle, that mental hurdle yet to be able to do it. But I can say with a fact, avocado is nasty. I want none of it. Um, but, but anyway, um, this, this is, this is a, kind of a portrait of what my childhood food, uh, you know, life was like. So this, this, this other family having this, to me, exotic food with this spam, cause I didn't know any better. I was, I, I was raised with very little outside culture. My family was, you know, pure Americana. So, right. uh, you know, to see something like that was just really weird. And I, I could never get myself to a point of, of being brave enough to give it a try. And that lasted through my entire childhood. I mean, I screwed up a, uh, our, our, my high school senior trip by being the only asshole who decided he didn't want to eat anything at all at the Cambodian food restaurant that we went to on our senior trip. Oh, man. And, deman- and, and demanded that I be taken to McDonald's afterwards to get food because there was nothing there that I was going to try because that's all weird food and I don't try it. I was a total dickhead that night. <laughs> Completely <laughs> And utterly at the time I felt like they were all being asses to me because they knew these people knew I didn't eat food like that. 
Why would they want to go to a place like that? I didn't realize these are all people that, are, that have not, they've grown up in the middle of nowhere and had no kind of, no ability to go to a cool restaurant like this. To them, it was this weird, neat new experience where they get to try all these foods that they've never seen before because they lived up in the hills and it was a cultural wasteland and right. they were trying to expand their horizons. And you have little, little, you know, douchey kid here who who spent time <laughs> living in the bay area at one point in his life so you'd think he would be one of the people that's more open to these things and he's like no i'm not eating this crap i'm a little bitch because i was i was a little bitch <laughs> hey i have hey. no problem admitting to my faults i am somebody who can admit to my faults and be okay with it because it, it i think it proves the inner strength i know i was, I was a little dick back then i've proved i've had to prove it to family over and over Right. I've had my dad. I've had my dad be surprised watching me eat uh, corned beef hash with fried eggs on top, breaking the yolk on the fried eggs, mixing it all together, and eating it. And my dad's just looking at me like, "How the hell are you doing that? You eat fried <laughs> eggs? When did you start eating fried eggs? And you mix it up with the yolk? How do you do that?" I'm like, "Why don't you?" And he's doing the exact same thing with the exact same food. Well, yeah, but I've never seen you do it. I'm like, "Well, I learned how to do things, Dad." Or, um, <laughs> or going to, or going to a really nice Mexican food restaurant with my brother. And, um, he was like, first time he's bought me food in probably 15 years, maybe 20 years. Right. I go out to dinner with him and he was just shocked that I said, he said, Hey, uh, you want some to eat? We can go to this Mexican food place. I was like, sure. Yeah. And he's looking at me like, what? Cause he remembers having to stand in line at McDonald's to get me a new hamburger. Cause they had put ketchup and mustard and pickles. The normal thing they put on, you know, the little hamburgers. Right. They put that on there, and I needed the burger completely plain because I wasn't going to eat it. You couldn't even scrape the stuff off. I wasn't going to eat it because the flavors were there, and I, I couldn't right. deal with it. Right. He remembers that. That's the last time he remembers going anywhere to eat with me and being responsible for eating with me. Oh man! As I'm a little, as I'm a, as I'm a jerky little kid, and so we ha he he orders this. We're ordering our food, and he orders a burrito. I order the same burrito. I'm like, yeah. The only difference is I don't want the avocado on it. Well, you want some guacamole on the side? Do you not get my desire to not have avocado anywhere near my food? <laughs> no avocado. No. Um, and thank then, you. And and it's you know it's it's one of them big gigantic you know four inch round five inch round burritos. It's like six inches, seven inches long. You know, just gigantic. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge thing. Um, and filled with rice and steak and all kinds of, of veggies and it's great, beautiful big burrito. And I just tear into that thing and devour the entire thing and he's just looking at me like eyes agape just like what the heck is going on I'm what have like, you done with weird, my brother it? and I, I, I said to him, it's weird isn't it he goes what do you mean i said you have the same look that dad had what, what, what do you mean what look when i went out to eat with him one time you had the same you have the exact same look on your face how the heck is he eating this he would never have touched this thing you know i i grew up i learned a few <laughs> things i tried a few more things now i can eat a lot more he's like yeah it's really weird i just I, I keep having you in mind as a little kid. I know. Now I'm a big fat kid. It's a whole, a whole difference. <laughs> but anyway, this, this, this ability of mine to later in life branch out with my food loves made this, this, this food spam, this thing that as a kid I, I just thought was weird and, and beyond my understanding of, yeah. of food. I mean, yeah. that was one of the most exotic things I remember seeing as a kid, how, how, how lame was my childhood. But as, as far as food went, <laughs> that was like super, super exotic. And Oh my God, you know, that, that's just, that's just strange. And then as an adult to have to, to finally try it, to enjoy it and to have it be such a, a favorite thing of mine. Cause it really is. It's, it's a special treat for myself. You know, it's not very expensive. It's still a special treat when I get it. However, like so many other things in my life, whenever I fall in love with something or find something that I, that I have interest in, mm -hmm. I'm a person who loves to do research about a thing. Like, like for instance, we've talked, we, we had our, a couple of, a couple of episodes ago, we had our discussion about Metallica and our favorite songs from Metallica albums. Right. And, um, I had friends when I was younger that listened to Metallica. We discussed this, but I didn't really get into Metallica until the Load album. That's the first one that I right, bought. That's right. the first one that I got into. And the first thing I did after getting into Load and buying Load was go back and buy all the previous albums and just devour all of them, them all the information I could. The stuff that I kind of half heard secondhand, yeah. I devoured it and made it part of my being. Because when you, when you love something like that, you try to know as much as you can about it. You do as much research as you can about it. Right, totally. Um, same, thing, 
same thing that happened when same thing that's, that happened as I my entire growing up about the uh, the 49ers, which is something else that I'm you know so passionate about. Um, I always knew about Star Wars, so it was, there was never a moment where I just went back and delved in. I just was always in, involved in that. Um, probably the same <laughs> with the 49ers. But, uh, you know, anything like that, if I fall in love with something, I do, I do my best to try to find the whole history of it, find out everything about it. Well, interestingly enough, that even comes to, together with food items that you would think, oh, I just like this food item, so I'm just going to eat this food item and it's going to be great. No. I go back and research it. I'm talking, I get weird research information. Like okay. um, my favorite, my favorite soft drink, for instance, this is a little sidebar. My favorite soft drink, my favorite cola uh-huh. is Pepsi. I, I am a Pepsi drinker. Okay. Pepsi over Coke. Right. Unless I'm mixing, unless I'm mixing with alcohol, then Coke over Pepsi. Coke just tastes better when you're mixing with alcohol. You know, you don't get a rum and Pepsi, yeah. you get a rum and Coke. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. It's, there's, there's a distinct flavor between the two colas and one's yeah. a good mixer and the other one's really not. Yeah, another example, you don't get a Jack and Coke because Jack and Coke is terrible because Jack is awful. Um, that isn't quite the same thing, but whatever. Um, point I'm making I am is, not letting I, you say that with me on the air. <laughs> I am saying that. No, no, I, I will not stand for that, sir. Jack and Coke is, is nectar, my friend. Okay, okay. I'll take a Crown and Coke, personally. But anyway. Crown and Coke is all um, right. Crown's, you know what, for me personally, Crown just has too much spice in it. For me to dig, crown and pineapple is even better. Crown and pineapple is good. It must be the oh, it yes. must be the spice of the crown and the coke. I've had crown and coke. It's okay. I just don't dig on it. Jack and Coke. There's something about like Jack as a sour mash is just kicks you in the gut and in the face and in the eyes and in the nose when you have it as a and straight I, shot. But and I don't like to be kicked. I understand that. Hence, hence my desire to not have it. Right, and I understand that, but I uh, can understand how when you put it in, when you put whiskey, most whiskeys, or Jack Daniels specifically, and mix it with Coke, it sweetens it up a lot to where it's just a really nice sweet drink. Um, but, dude, that is Lemmy's drink of choice, as it is also mine. I will, I will to vehemently, uh, I will vehemently deny your uh, your opinion of Jack Daniels and Coke. Okay. Hey, uh, that's all doesn't, I'm saying, man. Doesn't change it. But anyway. <laughs> you, um, know, you don't like have said, to, I'm, but I will not I will not let <laughs> let this aggression stand. <laughs> uh, it, it's still gonna be there forever, man. <laughs> um but anyway, I, I again I'm a Pepsi lover normally. Did you did you know that at one point Pepsi had like the sixth largest navy in the world? Did you know what? that? Yeah, uh, just a quick side. We're not story talking like military navy here, right? <laughs> yes, actually, yes. Pepsi owned a naval fleet. <laughs> yes, they were. Well, they were given one. Um, what the hell? Deal, who, who gave Pepsi made deal, the navy? The, I'm getting there. Get, let me get there. <laughs> they made a deal with a specific country to provide the, that country with Pepsi, and that country was supposed to pay them. But because of the laws in place in that country, they weren't allowed to use their money to pay somebody outside of their country. So instead, they gave them basically a fleet of warships, (laughs) submarines, destroyers, all that kind of stuff. I'm Googling this shit when we get off the air. (laughs) Now, here's the thing. Guess which country it was. What country would be crazy enough to give away a, a fleet of warships? To Pepsi, dude, and as basically as collateral for the money that they were owed. I, 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 I don't even know where, like, who the hell would have a navy to give people, and like, what did they die? Think of, think, just think, 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 think of the craziest country that would do something like that. That would be. That, I mean, this the thing is, it makes total sense because this is a country that would be like, well, I can't give you any money here. Have a submarine. <laughs> what country would do that? Who like like. What Germany? I have no clue. Oh come on! Think bigger than Germany. Bigger than Germany? Germany hasn't, Germany hasn't had. Germany has. Ireland Germany has a coast all over. Uh, bigger than Ireland Germany? doesn't need submarines. Huh? Uh, what, uh, what? Like China? Close. Shut up! It, w- it was Russia. Russia gave <laughs> yes. Pepsi a naval fleet. Yes. Like. People and submarines, like they're talking. Uh, I don't know if they gave them people. I don't know if they gave them like the, the people to man the, the the ships, but they gave them ships. 
What did they do with those ships? Did they sell them to somebody else? Did they uh, that, that I don't that part of the story I don't remember. I would have to did do. Did the they research deck again. them out in Pepsi flags? Like what did they do? Maybe they were part of the Pepsi points program back in the nineties, <laughs> late nineties. You remember the Pepsi point program? Oh yeah, they, yeah. Remember they did the they did the jet at one point. Maybe yeah. Ma- maybe no, that's what was he's like. Have a submarine? No, that would make. Yeah. <laughs> that that might have been that, the, that might have been the next sense. phase is you know here here's a submarine here's an ICBM <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't want their own ICBM in the backyard I mean if they get okay don't so worry. naval fleet if they don't get worry. an aircraft carrier do they get planes as part of it or is that a completely I don't know different if they, thing? I, I don't know if they got an aircraft carrier as part of it did their they fleet, get weapons they like you have to wonder how much they got yeah, no are you just it's, getting and, the boat or are you getting the nukes that go on the boat like what and, and again. This is a real thing that actually did happen. <laughs> These are things that I researched. So I actually at one point decided to research spam, where it came from, what, what, you know, anything, see if there's anything special about it. And guess what I found out? What did you found out? Spam is actually really, really important to the world. Really? In fact, spam may actually be responsible for the Allies winning World War II. Well, you can believe what? that. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. So we're going to take a break right now. Okay. I think this is the appropriate <laughs> time for a break. Yeah. When we come back, we, I'm going to tell you how Spam helped win World War II. This sounds fantastic. And this uh, The thing is, this is this is actually all real. You can even find all of this on the on. Well, I'll tell you later where you can find it so you don't stop listening right now. You'll find out. <laughs> at the end. But anyway, we'll be back in just a minute. All right. Hey friends, this is Mike from the Zenial Chronicles reminding you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Zencron, spelled X-E-N-C-H-R-O-N, to keep up to date on all things TXC. And please check out our official website, thezenialchronicles.com, or if that's too much to type, zencron.com. Thanks again for listening, and now, back to the show. And we are back. Hey, hey, hey. And so, into your slight history lesson. Yes, please. I got it. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super eager. First thing to explain is what spam is. Okay. Spam. Um, is, is spam. The, the name was was coined for it. Um, back in uh, back when it was made, J- July fifth, nineteen thirty seven, is when it was first introduced. Okay. okay? Um. The the brother of a company executive came up with the name of it, got a hundred dollar prize to name it. Um, wow! They they won't the, the Hormel company who owns Spam won't say what the actual meaning of the name is, but popular belief is that it's an abbreviation of spiced ham. Interesting. But it may it may or may not have other meaning. Who knows? Um, okay. And 1937 is a key as to when it was when it was made. But it, what what it is is it's pork shoulder, which at the time was was not a very desirable cut of meat. You didn't have a lot of people doing uh doing uh you know pulled pork and whatnot as, as major restaurant food. That was considered kind of poor people's food. And if we're being honest, in our day and age, that was also considered kind of I don't know I don't know, I don't know if, uh, uh, good way to say this it was food for people of color it was cheap fatty parts of the of the animal that were basically sold to what at the time was considered the less important part of the population and again that's Uh, what they would have been thought of as uh, at the time uh, so uh many of your families that were people of color during that time specifically black americans during that time would have been buying pork shoulders as their meat of choice because it was inexpensive and cooking the, the way that you would get inexpensive fatty cuts of meat to be palatable is to cook them at a low temperature for a long period of time right to gel- gelatinize that fat and make the the other tissue in it very tender and and juicy and that's how you get your your various pulled pork products if you're doing if you're doing a really good like smoked pork butt you're right. working with shoulder you're working with pork shoulder, right? Same type of meat that's used to become uh, to become spam. And again, at that time, okay. at, at that time, the United States, much like myself when I was a kid, had not grown up and opened up their taste buds to other right. cultural foods. Now you don't go. I mean, now you go specifically to barbecue places. You can get some pulled pork, so you can you know you can enjoy yourself some really good 
barbecue, pulled pork, smoked, pulled pork. So wait, um, hold on one second. So I can so I can kind of understand and synopsize yeah. this a little bit. The idea of with pulled pork, pulled pork was essentially <laughs> if I if I could go there for a minute. Pulled it pork sounds good. like food that white people didn't know how to cook, and they didn't like it. Yes. So yes. part of the oppressive culture from that time essentially put that part of the pork in the hands of those more disenfranchised, and it essentially became soul food, and then it was yes. reinserted into the population actually, as a popular actually, food? Most of your most of your soul food, uh, most, most soul food is based on parts of animals, that were not popular for white people to eat. And so the black culture at that time, that was the food that they could afford because it was the cheaper pieces. It wasn't the prime pieces that black, that, that, that white people like to eat. Wow. The affluent white people like to eat. Right. And so even, even the, even the idea of, 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 um, brining and frying, uh, the legs and wings of chickens, white people wanted chicken breasts. That's all they wanted. So legs and wings were considered the the auxiliary pieces that weren't wanted, and thus were cheaper, and it became actually part of the cultural food. Whoa! Now, I'm saying I'm saying this. I'm saying this. I want to admit that I am saying this from the the point of view of a white person who was raised in a white American household. Right. This is just the things that I have learned from. Uh, research that I have done. This is obviously not part of culture that I grew up in, and I only understand a minutia of the culture just from research and learning that I've done. Oh yeah, it's totally. not something that was that was uh, that was you know taught to me or, or a part of anything that I had growing up. Um, but yes, that is that is tr- traditionally how how it has happened. Many of the foods that are part of part of what we consider soul food now, or even Southern cooking now were foods that were the leftovers and cast off pieces of, of things that the affluent white people didn't want. The black culture of the time made amazing stuff out of it because it was still amazing food. It was yeah. just the undesirable part of the food. I mean, you also have to re- recognize bacon was considered undesirable part of uh, a pig until an ad campaign in, uh, in the post-World War II era trying to get rid of this uh, huge surplus of pig belly. Wow. A, a, a huge ad campaign was put through that, that bacon and eggs was like the perfect breakfast to have. It was a perfect middle class breakfast. You know, have your cup of coffee, your bacon and eggs while you read the newspaper and go off to work. And wow. so uh, otherwise it was considered it was considered low low meat, not part not something that everybody wanted. Lobster in Maine used to be prison food until uh there were until the invention of refrigerated train cars that could actually move the lobster without it spoiling and then they and then an ad campaign basically made lobster out to be a delicacy prisoners in maine rioted because they were being fed too much lobster wow these people had the right idea they were like no we don't want no giant ocean going cockroach anymore <laughs> screw that thing <laughs> why well, the ad people came in the ad people <laughs> came in and the ad people said hey hey everybody look what we have from here we have these these huge giant beautiful things look at all the meat that's inside them it's wonderful dip it in some clarified butter it tastes fantastic it's a delicacy. You can't find them everywhere. You want these, and you're willing to pay for them. L- L- and that's, okay, that's so, why people think lobster are, are that. That's why lobster is what it is. Okay, as so just to, just to kind of throw this out here, here, uh, just just to kind of throw it out, the evolution of so much delicacies at this point, I just really find it hilarious that it comes from the fact that white people don't know how to cook their damn food. I I will I will call it out as it is. Like that's one of the funniest. That's one of the funniest jokes on in in world history. With with yeah. that is that well, not- white people conquer for spices they don't know how to use. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it, our, honestly, uh, America is, is is we're such an amazing uh, country in the sense that whatever cultural identity the original people that lived in this country had is basically been destroyed because uh, the the European uh, settlers, invaders, let's call them the, what they were, the yeah. European invaders basically wiped out the entire uh, native culture of the United States, uh, first through disease and then through, you know, killing them and taking their land. Right, right. Um, so our actual native culture only comes down to like, Hey, look, we can call corn maize. Literally, that's <laughs> and, and turkeys, by the way. That's otherwise our, the native culture of America is, was, has basically been wiped away and destroyed. So there's very little examples of cultural native food. We have a few here in California, but it's very limited, at least for the 
the United States part of America. Um, right. Right. Some of the other, some of the other areas have. It's some, one of the most fascinating well, parts of our to, history and our culture. Like to be completely honest, I. Yeah, it's, it's and so. What, well, and then what happened is, as we brought people, as more people came in from different cultures, suddenly we started having all of these upwellings of great food here in America. But every single one of them is based on a culture, a food culture from another country. Yeah. You know, you, you, it's Italian food and it's, it's French food and it's Mexican food and yeah. it's Chinese food and it's Japanese food and it's Indian food. And I mean, really the only thing that is really American food is something like McDonald's <laughs> and that's barely American because French fries are Belgian. Hamburgers are technically German. And I mean, I guess we can own chicken nuggets, but do you want to? <laughs> That's yeah, and because really that is oh, yeah, yeah. Amer- America has America has no cuisine of its own. They even try to claim apple pie is American, but it's not. It's not. No, <laughs> no, it's nope. not. I believe it's it's either German or Austrian. I think it's so, German. I mean, so uh, uh, yeah, California or Cal- America doesn't have its own <laughs> real food culture. It has to take from all these other food cultures because, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could really say it that way. Uh, we can say it, I guess, as white people. White people don't know how to cook food on their own. They no. need to learn from other cultures. Yeah, yeah. No, that's um, that's that's like the first – that's the first thing yeah. I – yeah. When I learn about – that's one of the things I love about – the options and the places that you can go. I am always willing to try food. I've never tried before, especially from a culture. I've never tried their food from. Cause you I, know, I they're now, doing something right. You are. Uh, like I said, I, I, I am now, but when I was, when I was younger, yeah, no, never would have happened. <laughs> <laughs> never would have happened. Right. Um, hell, we can't even claim the ownership of sandwiches. That's British. So <laughs> yeah, there's that's nothing probably the that, good there's, food thing they did. I mean, I think, you know what? I think the only thing I believe, and, and a and lot of people on, are, well, pizza technically was done in New York, but like. Well, okay. Um, the, the version of pizza that we know was done in New York. Right. But they had, f- the, the, the basis for it was a flatbread that was made in the, the Naples region of Italy. So, I mean, there's. There's precedent for it before pizza was actually made. Right, right, right. It's the manufactured pizza of today is more of an American thing. We're that's the thing about the American culture. The American culture is really good at manufacturing original ideas. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> See, take, McDonald's take is an American food. We'll just, yeah, McDonald's is an American we'll, food because it's a manufactured burger. It's manufactured yeah, fries. It, uh, everything, like, everything is assembly line. Yes. That's what we're good at. Well, that's that's our calling card to food. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Henry Ford. Yeah. Um, well, and that's 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 our calling card. And that's what happened with spam. Was you took this this meat and ground it up, basically made it into this homogenous loaf and canned it and right. turned something that was a again a, a cultural food a um by necessity because it was cheap and expensive but otherwise a, a, at least to the to the main market to the larger market um to the let's be real white market of the time um boy we're getting political in this one i kind of like it um <laughs> i think we should do more of that but anyway uh we uh they, they make this this loaf thing and what's nice about it is it one it it takes uh something that is it is always an issue when it comes to food, um, something that is a perishable item and turns it into a non-perishable item. It turns it into something that's that's storable, that's potable. You know what I mean? This this is something that can sit on shelves for a decent amount of time. Oh, man. You can this. People can buy yeah. them. People can, can keep them. Well, the time frame, 1937, kind of coincides with some world events that are happening. <laughs> right. Um, so some tiny mustachioed art student who got kicked out of art school and decided he wanted to cause some trouble decides to cause a whole crap ton of trouble. <laughs> um, All because he, he didn't to, know how to paint. Well, I, the funny thing is, he, was, <laughs> he actually wasn't that bad a painter, but oh. people didn't like people didn't like his painting. So, you know, somebody somebody that's got a little bit of a uh, confidence issue and people are criticizing his stuff, he decides to go overboard. I, I'm, uh, I'm not yeah. trying to. But by the way, I'm not trying to belittle the situation of the horrors of what that man did. No, no, no. But Look, the capability what, of, what, of uh, the capability of 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 some 
uh, is immeasurable in some in some instances uh, in you know both the positive and the negative sense I guess not to get anyway, uh, not to get too yeah. deep into it but yeah I mean the, anyway this guy decides he's going to start invading a whole bunch of countries up in Europe can and, we at least agree um, that the guy's a complete dick. Yes, okay, of course he is. Okay, just to, um, just to make was. sure, like, this is not something that's essentially a positive outlook here. No, he's a douchebag. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the worst douchebags in history. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so he decides to start uh, going around invading a bunch of countries in, in, in Europe, uh, throwing a bunch of people into, uh, you know, prison camps, ovens, that kind of stuff. General douchey things. Yes. Exceptionally douchey. Not even general, <laughs> like, exceptionally like- douchey things. <laughs> Just overall, he's an excessive dick bag. That's pretty much yes. what happened. Um, and then he had a bunch of other see, people do it with him, which is a total dick see, maneuver. He, yes. And and he starts making some alliances with some countries. He makes some alliances with Italy, um, with who was being led by another complete douchebag. Yeah, I was gonna say, let's <laughs> you know let's make like, sure hi, that I, we're just like, hey guys, we're doing all this dumb stuff over here. Wanna be friends? No, the, yeah. the general public's like, like no. <laughs> like, guten tag, guten tag. I'm a douchebag. Bonjour, no, I'm a douchebag too. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly um, what happened. We're talking kinda, this specifically that's, between two assholes. That's kind of what's going on. And then you have, and then at the same time he's doing that, and you have Japan gets involved as well, and they become what we call the Axis powers later on. They all kind of treaty up together. Now, at that time, um, Hitler decides to also kind of try to make good good dealings to some extent with russia because russia is just friggin' huge and kind of in the middle of everything right so they're like hey tell you what russia we're invading all these places we ain't gonna invade you you don't you don't mess with us we don't mess with you when all this is over we'll give you a little bit of area uh, you know in the in in the eastern part of europe we just want the rest of it <laughs> and russia's like all right I mean, you're a douche, but you're going to give me some, so I'll just I'll just sit pat, no problem. Well, the United States, after having been involved in World War One, right. didn't necessarily want to get involved in another world war where Germany was causing trouble again because that's what happened in World War One. Right. And by the way, World War Two part of what part of what was the kind of vacuum of things that gave Hitler the ability to rise to power in World War Two or per, before World War Two and then start doing what he did for World War Two was a direct result of how the end game of World War One was handled. This is a history lesson for a whole different time. Oh yeah. But World War Two happened because of what happened after World War One. Yes. Um and yeah. in many ways in many ways that's responsible for all the problems anyway. Um, U.S. was not wanting to get involved directly. However, they were sending arms, ammunition. They were sending soldiers uh, over. Uh, there's there's pilots that went over to to uh, England to help fight, uh, fly against the Luftwaffe coming in and doing the blitz in England, bo- bombing England. Um, oh yeah, one of the things the United States. Yeah, we're one we're of the really the good States at. Went and did. Yeah, one yeah. Of, one of the things we're that's because one of the things that we're really good at is not only manufacturing but also making a ton of money. That's yes. kind of oh, yes. we do both of those things very well. Yes, America likes to make money. I like money. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, one thing that America did decide to do as part of their uh, pre-war war effort was they kind of stopped Japan, which is Japan's an, an island nation, right? When yes. you're on an island nation, you have you have a limit to your resources. True. Well, one of the resor- one of the resources that would be very limited with Japan, especially considering it's a volcanic island. Um, now this oh. is kind of there's a little bit of ge- ge- geology that has to go involved in this. I mean, you know, you know, it's a volcanic island. Mount Fuji is a volcano. It's a giant ass volcano. Yes, I so, did know so, Mount Fuji was a volcano, and that's kind of like a really big deal. Yeah, Japan is basically the top of a, of a volcanic mountain. Yes, all of Japan is. This is the part of the mountain that's above sea level. Um, just like Hawaii, that's the part yep. of the mountain that's above sea level. Yep. Um, actually, although Hawaii is a, Hawaii is a weird one. Hawaii is a weird one because Japan is actually in a subduction zone, so you expect volcanoes to be there. Hawaii is actually in the dead center of the Pacific Plate, so what that actually the reason that that volcano exists is actually an upwelling in the middle of the plate, and that's why the Hawaiian Islands have that kind of weird curve to them. You know the various islands. This right. is where the uh, the Pacific Plate has moved over this upwelling because the upwelling is below the Pacific Plate. So every time that oh. that upwelling is punched through, it's created a new island, 
And so, you know, thousands and thousands of years from now, there will be another island in the Hawaiian chain south west the southeast of the current uh big island that's Whoa. how that, that's how hawaii works sorry i, I did I, not I did, know I, that i dabbled a little in i dabbled a little in, in uh in geology there's only a few places on the planet where you have the uh those upwellings in the middle of uh plate tectonics most of the time volcanoes are on uh volcanic uh or on plate boundaries right subduction zones the, sub, the, the subduction of one plate underneath another plate is right. what causes the the magma chambers to form and and uh, it, it's what caused like the Cascade Range of, of volcanoes um, in Northern California and up through Oregon and, and Washington. Wait a minute. Um, does that mean? Yeah. Does that make? From what you're saying, does that make Hawaii an anomaly, or does it make Japan an anomaly? Hawaii is the anomaly. Japan is on the Ring of Fire. It's on. The, it's it's at the subduction zone. Okay. Where the where the uh, Pacific Plate and the Asi- Asiatic Plate meet. Gotcha. Okay. So and they're, they're Hawaii seems zone to there. be more active. Doesn't it? Um, that doesn't that 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 has no uh, no bearing on the location of, of the okay of where the volcano is. Has no that's interesting. I, I I did not know like any of well, that. That's actually one of really, the really one of cool. the one of the other big uh, um, mid continental upwellings is actually Yosemite National Park. That is right. a giant. The, the entire right. T of Yosemite National Park is a giant caldera, and yes. it's an upwelling in the middle of the North American plate, which is a very, very thick continental plate. And for some reason, there's an upwelling magma chamber in the middle of it. There's no other volcanoes anywhere near that because it's the middle of a plate. You shouldn't have a volcano there. It shouldn't exist. It's an right. upwelling of of the magma chamber. So those two, Hawaii and there, and I think there's one more somewhere over. Forget exactly where it is. No, the one in the caldera in in uh, in the Mediterranean. Mediterranean's all part of a plate. So, whoa. But yeah, it, it's just uh, that's plate tectonics a whole other thing. But yeah, the the Yosemite one and Hawaii really weird that they're in the middle like that. But anyway, yeah. Um, Japan Japan itself is again it's an island, it's a volcanic island, so it only has so many resources. So right, one of the right, resources right. that they that they don't have is they don't have oil reserves. Because oh. in a volcanic island, you're not going to get oil reserves. For you to have oil reserves, you have to have had places where uh, dinosaurs specifically have died and then decomposed, been buried under you know tons of rock, and then basically turned into crude oil by the pressure from the from all that rock. Because life is is or carbon-based life forms that's what oil is is basically a a carbon-based product right and so oil comes from you know dead dinosaurs right and japan being a volcanic island it doesn't have its own oil reserves it has to get oil from other places well during world war ii one of the things japan was doing was invading up and down the coast of china it invaded into the uh philippines into china itself uh, in fact, they, they uh, in the invasion into the Philippines, they sent uh, General MacArthur leaving the Philippines. But they were trying to get territory, and they were trying to get oil. Well, the United States effectively cut off the oil going to Japan and all the shipping routes. Well, by oh. doing that, Japan... By doing that, Japan had about six months of oil left before the entire country would be completely dried up of oil. Right. So Japan decided that they were going to take action against it and plan an attack on Pearl Harbor, which they did. So that's and why that, they did it. That's why they attacked Pearl Harbor. So it wasn't a power move. They were looking for oil. They were well. They were they were basically lashing out at the at the country that cut off their oil supply. Gotcha. Okay. So it that this catapults the United States into into World War II. There are many theories around it whether the United States did it on purpose so that Japan would attack them so they'd have reason they'd, they'd have enough reason to get support to jump into World War II. There's so many things about it. We're not talking about that right now. Another podcast, another time. Yeah. Um, but you had the United States then hop into war against Japan. When they declared war against Japan, immediately Italy and Germany declared war against the United States because they, they were, you know, Axis powers. connected together with Japan. Right. Um, and so the United States hopped into war against Germany. Germany also decides around this same time. Now, I'm not getting exact dates right, but this is just it's just part of the weaving of the story of, of spam. Because spam is what we are talking about here <laughs> uh, with the context well, of so World War There's so much that goes II. into it, yeah. Um. Germany decides that they're not going to honor their their kind of agreement with with Russia, which I mean the Russians kind of sh- should have seen that coming because like 
if the douchebag at the party, like the head douchebag at the party, says he's going to leave your shit alone and then hook you up later, do you really believe him? If you do, that's your fault. Because you know right. he's going to screw you over. Right. Well, Hitler says, I'm going to screw you over. He did not pay attention to historical precedents, which, by the way, it's a very important thing to to pay attention to historical precedents. I'm not saying you let it completely control you, but if the same type of events, like, I don't know, a, a massive uh, pandemic happens, right? right? And people can stop the pandemic from happening by wearing masks. People refuse to. And you have multiple waves of the pandemic so <laughs> big that, 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 that this pandemic creates, it creates such a huge thing that it's actually in history books under the, the, the heading, the Spanish flu. Yeah. The 1918 Spanish because by flu. the way, the, because, because by the way, the reason it's called that is because the only country that actually truthfully reported numbers of, of sick and dead regularly Spain. was Spain. Yeah. Because every other country at the time was involved in World War One and didn't want to didn't want to show weakness as to how many people were actually dying. I think something like twenty million people died during that, more than what died during the wars. I may be wrong on my number, but it was a large number. Wait, um, are you trying to say? Oh, <laughs> I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> am I trying to say what? Are you trying to say that hiding numbers and stopping people from knowing exactly how deadly something is is actually extremely dangerous? It is very dangerous to do. And I'm just saying that, that when we see, when we have things like that and we find ourselves in conditions that are much similar to that, mm -hmm. we should really look at the historic precedents and see how much trouble, the, trouble they had previously in the way they did and try not to do things the same way. Yeah. This is where absolutely. Hitler made his mistake. This is where Hitler made his mistake. He attempted to invade Russia. He tried to start a land war in Asia. Now we have been told by the movie Princess Bride that it's that that's not a very smart thing to do. <laughs> but if we had studied European history, we would know that Napoleon tried to invade Asia. Yes. He tried to start a land war in Asia. He tried to invade Russia, and it didn't go very well for him either. In fact, it was basically what sent him into the spiral that ended with him being deposed and living out the rest of his island or his life on an island where he was poisoned by the wallpaper to death. Um, true story, also. Uh, by actually, the, way. the wow. wall, the wallpaper, the wallpaper poisoned him to death. Was um, there lead in the wallpaper? Arsenic, actually. It was used to make oh. a green coloring that was very popular during that time period. Oh, um, wow. Out of wallpaper, especially because it was a, it was a, it was kind of a tropical, subtropical island. So like it leached out of the wallpaper from all the humidity and stuff. Oh um, man. Oh yeah. Whole different story. But yeah, if Hitler paid choice. attention to his history, if Hitler had, 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 had actually paid attention to research, what Napoleon had screwed up on, he would have realized that it was a bad idea to try to invade invade russia especially if you try to do it as winter is coming along because that's a really bad time to do it. if you're invading somewhere you need to be able to keep your supply lines so if you don't have your supply lines you're not getting your food your munitions your reserve soldiers you need to have those and it was it was difficult because the the the, the weather the massive snow was right. making it really really difficult for him to do it but he almost succeeded actually the thing is he almost did it he actually probably could have succeeded because of the siege of Stalingrad. Stalingrad was kind of, I mean, you, uh, if you've seen, if you remember the movie Enemy at the Gates, that's a good, uh, that's a really good one for the siege of Stalingrad. It's not true, but it's still a, <laughs> a, a, it's enjoyable. a good one. Uh, I um, did not see Enemy at the Gates, actually. Okay. That one's well, a little while back. That That's around our blockbuster days is when that came out, right? It, it was, yeah. It's one of those, um, Ray Fiennes is in that, right? Uh, yes, Ray Fines, um, Ed Harris. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying yeah, to yeah. think of who else in there. Um, it's oh, not bad uh, for a guy who never watched the damn movie to understand that that actor was still there. Ah, oh, some of my blockbuster Hellboy. memory still serves me well. Oh, uh, Hellboy. Ron, Ron Perlman. Uh, yeah, Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman was in it, and then, um, I'm trying to think of the girl that was in it. Uh, she's the one from the first two Mummy movies. Uh, I can't think of her name right now, but anyway, mm -hmm. um, not important. Bob Hoskins was also in it. I think Bob Hoskins was uh was Stalin. I'm not sure. Rachel Wise. Rachel Wise. Thank you. Yeah. Um. But anyway, uh, the 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 Germans kind of had Stalingrad surrounded. They were starving them out. And um, wow. Thing is, the Germans had the Germans had at the time in World War II. They had some of the uh, until the United States entered. They had the best technology. Even when the United States entered, the United States was doing its best to catch up to German technology. In fact, after World War. 
too. Um, when when the United States was kind of helping clean everything up, they went in you, during uh, something called Project Paperclip and basically snagged away as many of the German scientists as they could, specifically their scientists for uh, for munitions and rockets and things like that. Because at that time, the the rockets that they were building in Germany, they were building rockets to fire from Germany to land in like england and stuff they were they were i mean we're talking icbms before icbms even existed yeah they were they were really far ahead in that technology um the with project paperclip the united states just grabbed them all brought them to the u.s and put them into nasa and they are what is responsible for the the saturn rockets and the the rockets that that the Apollo rockets, everything that those are the Gemini rockets, everything that sent basically men to the moon and men into orbit, the German scientists were responsible for World War II German scientists. Wow. So, um, yeah. Um, Whoa. Cause they, their technology <laughs> was up on things. And so when they were invading well, Russia, right, they had right. this technology to go against them. What Russia had that Germany did not have was a shit ton of people. In fact, more <laughs> ger- or more more Russians died in World War II than than every other country's deaths for World War II combined. Really, more Russians died. Holy shit! Because there's a thing. There's another thing that you don't know about that happened uh, uh, the same day that uh, the bomb was dropped in Nagasaki, uh, and that is that uh, there was an area of China that Japan had invaded and had taken over. And the same day that the bomb was dropped in Nagasaki, Russia invaded that area of China that Japan had taken over and basically destroyed the entire J- Japanese encampment there. Everything that Japan had taken over, they Whoa. destroyed it. So that actually, we, we don't teach that in American schools. We just teach, hey, guess what? Truman decided to drop a couple bombs and Japan said, oh, crap, we surrender. No, there was actually a Russian attack on the, the mainland held area that Japan had and Russia just stormed into there and destroyed everything well we and wouldn't so that that would that make sense that we bones. wouldn't mention it because when we were kids the cold war was still happening like yeah, they Russia was the didn't guy. even mention we that. Didn't want yeah. to say anything good about that yeah exactly well, that's the thing is that's why we didn't learn this story so stalingrad that's was fan- basically that being- is fascinating dude i never learned about that um, obviously no, I'm, so I'm not- right but and i'm not and i'm not done oh man like okay I said, St- stalingrad was being was being surrounded millions of of russian lives were being lost germans a lot of lives lost there but they had them they had the the better technology they were they were sieging this city and the city was starting to starve until until they started seeing shipments of food now not only were the shipment of food shipments of food going into russia but the shipments of food were going across the Pacific. And who was bringing them? The United States. Now, as the United States, I'm going to shift to the Pacific Theater real quick. As the United States was was island hopping across the, the Pacific, trying to get to a, an island base close enough that they could effectively attack the, the island of Japan, oh, the mainland for them. Right. Were, and that's what the whole island hopping was about. They had yeah. Hawaii. But if you look at it, if you look at a globe, Hawaii is really, really far away. Yeah, from Japan. I mean, the the Japanese fleet had to go all the way across the, or at least halfway across the Pacific Ocean, in, in secrecy to make that attack. It was a one time deal. It wasn't going to happen again. Yeah, you can't so, just like hop off of freaking. You can't hop off of Oregon or Alaska or or, well, or Alaska, Hawaii. You could. And, well, you could do it from Alaska. And actually, and actually, there were uh, some of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. Yeah, some of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska were being uh, were actually being occupied by the Japanese during uh, World oh, War II. Oh, so obvious. But, okay, so Alaska is, wasn't exactly is, fully in that. That was it not wasn't a state yet. Oh, it was just I a did not know that. It okay. was just a territory during World War II. Okay, and we had we we barely had a road that could get to Alaska. The Alcan Highway was barely in existence at that point in time. Okay. It was just a, basically a dirt road that half the year you couldn't even uh, traverse through. It was almost impossible to get up to Alaska. So Alaska was not really a... a, a it's not a, a viable... Yeah, it's not a viable option no, at this point. So, and, and you couldn't just like launch out of like San Francisco or Oregon and hit Japan. Like You can't do that. We no, didn't have no. that capability. We that is have, way farther away than you could assume. Yeah, you, have to, you, have to re, you had to refuel too much. We the, the technology at the time wouldn't allow those type of things. Wow. So... 
So that's where, that's where the island hopping came in. That's why right. you had to go to Midway, to Guadalcanal, right. to Iwo Jima, yep. all these different islands, yep. to Okinawa, to get all these islands to be able to control this, to the back to the Philippines and bring General MacArthur back to the Philippines. And as they were coming back, one of the things that ended up coming with the soldiers was this this new product, this inexpensive canned product that could travel all over the place. It had meat in it, so it gave you some kind of uh, protein. Protein it sustenance. Gave you the meat that you wanted. Yep. And long term spam. Spam went with the army. It went with the military wow. all across the Pacific, which is why in Hawaiian cooking, in Filipino cooking, basically every single country up and down the uh, the Southeast Asia and all through the Pacific Islands. That's the Spam has actually hopping. become a part. This Spam has actually become a huge part of their culture and of their their food products because during wartime, when things were rationed and things were you know difficult to find, this was a a storable food product. That, that I mean, they didn't have to worry about spoilage. They didn't have to worry about how long they could keep it. And it was being given by the military to people to help these various peoples when they were rebuilding. Well, that's fantastic. At the, at the same time, that happened through the Pacific in Russia, since they had started fighting against the Germans and they basically became, yes, people, the Russians were our allies in World War II. Yes. They were. There are pictures of Stalin and Franklin Delano Roosevelt sitting and talking together and Winston Churchill sitting and talking together, yeah. trying to work things out because we yeah. were all allies at that point. Well, th um, yeah, uh, this is, uh, this the, was one of those situations, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, th that's where words, yeah. we had to take in, in some instances we had to do that. Um, and that's man, you know, all's fair in love and war. So, right. So, so, so what ended up happening was Russia suddenly started getting this influx of spam. And it just so happened to be around the time that the siege of Stalingrad was happening. And Russia was able, they had, had no other food sources because everything had been destroyed as the Germans were marching forward. That you know, the, the whole countryside is being destroyed. They were running out of food. They were starving. And that's what the Germans, I mean, that's what you do in a siege. You try to starve out the, the enemy. Right. Once you starve them out, it's easy to, to just march right. through the city streets. Yeah. They, just as they were having to have the, all of these starvation problems and these issues in Stalingrad, the shipments started arriving, the relief shipments of food, and spam was one of the chief things as of this relief of food. Yeah. And these the the Soviet army was able to push back the Germans, push them all the way back to where their attempt to invade Russia was basically what helped to start their downfall on that front. And then on the other front you have D Day happening that brings the yeah. downfall from the other and side. And so they were closed but in it, on both sides at that time. But to give you an idea of how important it was, in his memoir, okay, Khrushchev remembers. Nikita Khrushchev. You yeah. know who that is, right? I, yes, I do. You know, banging his shoe on the table guy. Yep. Nikita Khrushchev <laughs> declared. Anybody anybody who's listening who doesn't know who Nikita Khrushchev is, look him up. Yeah. He, he was he was basically a, a, a very high-ranking political figure in Russia during the yes. Cold War. Yeah. Um, he declared, in, in, again, in his memoir, Without spam, we wouldn't have been able to feed our army. Throughout the war, countries ravaged by the conflict and faced with strict food rations came to appreciate spam. This dude, this dude in his memoir, wow. thanks spam for saving the <laughs> army. Dude, that's that's amazing. And to know, to, so so to realize that this this humble little food that's sitting in your sitting in the in the grocery store with all the other canned meats that people make fun of, oh, it's spam. That little little me thought was some weird exotic food, actually was what fed people in the Pacific Islands as their homes were ravaged because of war, and what helped the Soviet army be able to push back the Germans, and help World War II be won. That's just Dude. amazing to think that this little can, this little can of ground up pork shoulder, had that big of an influence on the world. That's insane. It's okay, amazing. that just all right. So I would consider at that point that spam is something that America as a country should be proud of. So wait, can we say that spam is true American cuisine? So yes. Can't really think of anything else. Spam yeah. is our cuisine. Spam is okay. Think about think about the details of spam. Okay, the details of spam and the way that it's made. It's as American as anything else. It is canned, manufactured pork. That's what it is. That's as American yeah. as you could possibly get as a food. That's as American That's, as McDonald's is. Okay. 
So here's what I'm saying right now. Here's what I'm saying right now. I'm going on record for this. Okay. It's on the, it's on the podcast. It's on record. <laughs> Veterans Day. Memorial Day. D-Day. Dude. Fourth of July. Yes. Spam is the new food that you need to eat on those days. 100%. You I am freedom, fully behind you on that. Fully if you behind. Love freedom, if you love your country, you need to recognize that that food, more than any other food we have ever made, spam is what helped save the world back in World War II. Dude. It's more American than anything else. Dude, I am I'm I am right now. there with you. That is dope. I am right there with you. Yes. That's that is the that is dude, that is the moral of this episode. I would call it 100%. And I'm challenge I'm I'm going to challenge anybody that uh that is that listens to this. Uh, and I'll put it out on those days. Again, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, uh, the anniversary of D-Day. Yep. And uh, hell, let's throw let's throw the anniversary of, of Pearl Harbor, so Pearl Harbor Day in there, and the Fourth of July. I'm gonna put this. I'm gonna write this out. Uh, put post it on the Facebook. Yeah. Post it on Twitter. Yeah. This is this is when. This is yeah. No, this is real. You need to ha- you need to have spam to celebrate what spam has done for this country, what spam has done for this world. Yes. Yes. And celebrate it as the American dude. food that helped to save the world. I love the it. American food. I love it. And I want pictures. I'm going to I'm gonna be asking on those days for people to post pictures yep. of themselves enjoying Spam and being patriotic and loving their country. Yep. Just please, please, if you do it, don't do it on like American flag plates or with American flag. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, That's a terrible idea. That is in uh-uh. violation nope. of flag code. Yep. Absolutely. Respect the flag. Don't put it on something you're going to throw away because that's not respecting your flag. That's exactly right. So that's the, I, did I blow your mind completely? With you the blew spam? my mind, bro. You blew my mind and you made me like such a fan of spam in like an hour, hour and a half worth of time. That's not even funny. That's, that's this good. was this was fantastic. I am so, so happy with all of it. That's good. Well, Mike, here's the part of the show where I ask, where will people be listening to us? Well, if you're listening to us on our official website, it is called the com, or you may have typed zencron.com if you don't want to type that much, which we understand. Um, we are also on basically any of the major podcasting forums. We're on Spotify. We're on TuneIn. We're on Apple. Uh, we are also on YouTube as well. Um, oh, we are also on Google. I'll, I'll, I'll mention Google. We are also on YouTube as yes. well. Uh, if you're listening to us on the podcast, uh, you can also subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, which we would love if you could Please subscribe do. and hit that bell icon, especially if you're listening to us on YouTube right now. And I Click believe that is, well, and of course you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. As I said, that's where I'm going to post the list of days yes. where people should enjoy spam, celebrate spam. It is the American food. And yes. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever I can to promote that. I'm just little old James living here in Northern California that, that my, my voice only goes so far. But I will do whatever I can to, to push spam as the true American food, the world-changing food that we need to have more respect for. And we need to celebrate. Yes, absolutely. On the, on all the days I think that we celebrate the greatness of this country. That's, dude, I think that's amazing. And, dude, spam has now become in every... On every major American holiday, on every major American holiday, spam is going to be incorporated in some way, especially like barbecues and stuff. Dude, you're either going to barbecue it, it, it to or you're going to you're going to have it out on a sampler plate or what have you. Like creative spam usage, like needs to be a thing. Definitely needs to be uh, a thing. I, I'm a, I, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it right dude i'm going to get in some spam yeah. this week i i can't not now i can't uh good luck good good luck by the way um, oh is it, an, that's is one it of those, an... yeah it's one of those things that uh interestingly enough gets snagged up really quickly during um you know those pandemic things that if we paid attention to history <laughs> we would know how to deal with better <laughs> well that makes um, that makes total sense man everybody's talking about the shortage of toilet paper why isn't there a shortage of spam? Unless there is. I mean, there I, is, I don't there know. Is. There, there's the a thing. shortage there of spam is. as well. It makes sense. It's, dude, it's shelf stable. It's shelf stable for like exactly. days. Exactly. For sure. How can this How can this not be be the most American of foods? Dude, anyway, right? Thank, th- thank you, everybody, for listening. Hopefully, I've inspired you to get some spam. Hopefully, Mike has inspired you to have different ways to, uh, to consume your spam. Yeah. And you're feeling the same as he is. Um, I'm again, excited, Thank you man. all for listening. And we'll be back again with something next week (laughs) y'all have a good one
Thank you for tuning in, friends. The journey continues next week. <laughs>